My name is Andrew Foster, and I'm narrating this slideshow on behalf of its author, Dr. Dagmar Holmquist, who is a consultant in the intensive care unit at Princess Alexandra Hospital. This presentation is intended for non-anaesthetists, non-intensivists, and people new to the ICU during this COVID crisis. So our objectives for now are looking at Don and Doffing of PPE um, and looking at the ventilator settings and modes of ventilation that you'll come across. We'll also talk briefly about uh, ventilation in relation to COVID-19 and to go through what to do when a patient desaturates during mechanical ventilation. We don't want you to be experts, just safe, which means basic troubleshooting and knowing when to ask for help. So first of all, donning and doffing. Uh, as the ICU is, is deemed as a high risk environment, everyone looking after patients there uh, needs to be fit tested and you can be fit tested in the ED seminar room on the ground floor or down an endoscopy in the ADSU. Um, this is done Monday to Sunday, all week, uh, in working hours and often into the night. Um, you can see some helpful guides there from Public Health England, and you can also access Public Health England on YouTube where you can see the videos of how to do it. Um, it's important to have a buddy to help you gown up because uh, you need to be covered up around the back as well and in the ICU it's common practice to wear a pair of surgical gloves underneath a pair of blue gloves and changing those blue gloves between patients. Um, and please make sure that you change out of your raspberry scrubs when you leave the department. So to illustrate the burden of COVID-19 and critical care, the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre tell us that just under 4,700 people have been admitted to critical care units in the UK with confirmed COVID-19 and outcome data has been submitted to roughly 80% of these patients. And you can see there that roughly half as many have died as being discharged alive from critical care. So there's still quite a few patients uh, within critical care in the UK itself. And, um, 66%, two thirds of all COVID-19 patients who are mechanically ventilated have died. And the projections for Princess Alexandra Hospital is that we're going to have between 80 and 100 ventilated patients. So why do we ventilate patients? Well, primarily it's for a failure of people to oxygenate, failure to ventilate, for airway protection, and for a high work of breathing that leads to exhaustion and ultimately a failure to ventilate. So it's easy to be intimidated by ventilators because there's lots of different types and they can look pretty complicated, but all you really need to know are the basic settings. And these are tidal volume, which is the volume of each inspired breath, and respiratory rate. So we can manipulate these on the ventilator to determine minute volume, which ultimately influences gas exchange. Fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2. So this is expressed on this ventilator here as a percentage and we can deliver anything from 21 to 100% oxygen. Uh, although we do try and reduce it to be less than 60 as too much oxygen can be harmful to the lung. Inspiratory and expiratory time or IE ratio. So this is the ratio of inspiration and expiration. Normal IE ratio is one to two and up to one to four. So Inspiration is usually shorter than the expiratory phase normally. And to give you a practical context, um, for example, a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute means that each breath cycle takes six seconds. So an IE ratio of one to two would mean 
two seconds of inspiration with four seconds for expiration. Manipulating the IE ratio allows the intensivist to manipulate not only carbon dioxide clearance by prolonging the expiratory phase, but also oxygenation by shortening the expiratory phase. Peak inspiratory pressure or P-INSP on this ventilator or PIP you'll see in the textbooks. This is the pressure as measured at the peak of an inspired breath. If it's too high, pressure related injury to the lungs called barotrauma will occur. And we try to ventilate at the least possible peak inspired pressure. So we program the P imps to somewhere between 30 and 40. So if the inspired pressure reaches the preset limit, the inspired breath cuts out and expiration will be allowed to occur. A rising P imps may indicate a reduced compliance in the lung. Positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP. So this is the pressure in the alveolus at the end of expiration. And this can also be manipulated, although it does lead to increased um, inspired pressure. So uh, the way it works is that it keeps the alveoli open at the end of expiration. And this increases the surface area for primarily oxygenation because it doesn't influence tidal volume. So carbon dioxide clearance will not be affected. So here are the ventilation modes that you'll probably come across. Um, volume control, pressure control, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, and pressure support. Let's have a look at these ventilation modes in a little bit more detail. And the first is volume control. So this is when a preset tidal volume is delivered with a constant inspiratory flow. So peak inspiratory pressure will vary according to chest wall compliance and airway resistance. So if airway resistance is good, then the preset volume will reach the lungs. If it's not very good or if lung compliance is poor, then Airway pressure will be high, so not all of the volume will get in. Pressure control is when the ventilator delivers an inspiratory flow until the P-INSP is achieved. So tidal volume will vary according to changes in compliance and airway resistance. But if we want to guarantee that tidal volume, we can use a sub-mode where the ventilator will slow down its inspiratory flow in order to try and get that whole tidal volume in. SIMV is a ventilator mode that will deliver either a preset volume controlled breath or a pressure controlled breath in coordination with the patient's spontaneous respiratory effort. Uh, the ventilator will tell you how many spontaneous breaths the patient's taking and you'll also see it on the waveform display that's indicated by color change. Uh, this can provide full support or no support depending on the respiratory rate that's set. Pressure support ventilation is similar to pressure control, but it's a spontaneous mode of ventilation. So it provides a constant support of pressure once a ventilator senses that the patient's made an inspiratory effort. And again, like pressure control, the tidal volume is determined by the pressure support and the lung characteristics, as well as patient effort. Uh, and there's a mode called pressure support ventilation pro, which will kick in if it senses that the patient becomes apneic. Many of our patients with COVID-19 who are being mechanically ventilated, are displaying the characteristics of ARDS and acute lung injury. So we employ what's known as lung protective strategies. 
So this means that we use low tidal volumes uh, with minimal respiratory rates to accept permissive hypercarbia as long as the pH is greater than 7.2. Trying to use as little PEEP as possible to achieve uh, saturations of 88 to 92% and use of muscle relaxants along with sedation when it's indicated. And we're finding that positioning patients prone is improving oxygenation and uh, if we do this early and regularly this helps as well as um, conservative fluid management. But what's the price to pay for a low tidal volume? And you guessed it, decreasing saturation is a concern along with an increasing PCO2 and a consequent acidosis. What's important to remember if someone desaturates, and it can happen very quickly in these patients, is not to panic. Um, and you need to check a few things. So here's a helpful guide, starting on the left in the green. Uh, the first thing to do is check the pulse oximeter and its position and readjust. Uh, if the saturations are still low, then move over to the pink section in the middle there. And you wanna rule out whether the circuit has become disconnected. So um, starting from the ET tube and working your way back towards the ventilator, look for visible signs of disconnection uh, and abnormal noises coming from it, but also listen to noises from the patient, so gurgling, bubbling, or a gas rush that might indicate that the ET tube cuff is leaking or indeed the ET tube has become misplaced. You'll also notice a loss of the end tidal CO2 trace, uh, as well as the low pressure and volume alarms uh, sounding off on the ventilator itself. Just reconnect things if, if uh, you can see a visible disconnection and call for help. Um, patients will have abnormal breathing patterns, um, some may bite and cough against the tube and some may also be trying to breathe on top of a delivered cycled breath from the ventilator. Um, and this could be accompanied with a, an increased heart rate, blood pressure and respiratory rate. Uh, the thing to do is to bolus sedation first followed by muscle relaxant and call for help. Uh, we use humidified circuits for a ventilated patient, so there can be a lot of uh, water buildup and secretions in the ET tube, uh, water being in the ventilator circuit usually, or the, uh, the ET tube or circuit may even be kinked. Um, you'll know this because the high pressure alarm will sound off and there'll be a drop in tidal volume also. Uh, it's important to uh, call for help or some someone to come and assess the situation immediately. And, and while you're waiting for help, if that's delayed, check your ventilator settings. So increase the oxygen to 100%, ask for advice on um, whether to increase the PEEP and make sure that the respiratory rate is set at greater than 12. This is a useful guide and what to expect in handover, both in getting handover and giving handover. So you must know who and how to call in an emergency, what your sedation and muscle relaxant backup plan is, because there's many different types that suit many different patients. Um, and what we call the monitor for, so what the patient's oxygen saturations are, the entitled CO2, heart rate and blood pressure, and the ventilator for, so how to adjust oxygen, how to adjust PEEP, and how to change tidal volume and respiratory rate. And as I said earlier, we use different ventilators, so these buttons are in different places on different ventilators, but also know what uh, treatment limitations there are on your patient. What's good to know is cardiovascular support is the patient on vasopressors or inotropes and what doses these are when the infusion's likely to run out and in need of replacement, what the patient's fluid balance target is, as well as the potassium levels that can be measured on regular bloods and your ABG. And in summary then, 
What's important is that you know your handover basics, including the monitor and ventilator for, and also what to do if the patient desaturates. The ICU is a busy place at the best of times, and more so at the moment. So it's important that you list uh, your priorities for your shift and revisit them on a regular basis because we all know that we forget things when we are busy. And also, no matter what you do, no matter how much you think you don't know or how ex inexperienced you feel, that you will be helping and saving lives. Thank you for watching. We really hope that you found this helpful.